Hey, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our final speaker in our gender equity and ethics uh, series. I want to first uh, welcome the speakers that are the attendants uh, virtually as well as the audience here in P117. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Julie Euler as our speaker uh, today. Also want to acknowledge that she has been the force behind the gender equity and ethics um, series that uh, we have had. So uh, Dr. Euler is a professor and associate program director uh, for the University of Chicago Internal Medicine Residency Program. She completed her undergraduate education at Stanford University and then came to University of Chicago for her medical degree, her internal medicine residency, followed by her chief residency. She developed University of Chicago Medicine's Quality Improvement Curriculum, which is a two-year curriculum that's been used to teach over 500 internal medicine residents, some of whom are in the audience, practice based learning and improvement, as well as systems-based practice. It's also been used as the basis of curricula for all over the country in internal medicine residency program training. She currently is the co-director for the Healthcare Delivery Improvement Science Track at University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine, which was developed to train medical student leaders in quality improvement and patient safety, and it can claim graduates who are currently chief quality and safety officers at other fine institutions. Dr. Euler teaches quality improvement and patient safety for the Association of American Medical Colleges Teach for Quality Program, the Society of Hospital Medicine's Quality and Safety Educator Academy, and the American College of Physicians Advanced Quality Improvement Program. She's on the committee to revise the AAMC Quality Improvement Patient Safety Competencies, as well as provides QI coaching for individuals and practices through ACP Advance. She currently practices as a primary care provider here on the south side of Chicago. She has been chair of the University of Chicago Department of Medicine uh, Women's Committee since 2017 and has led very important initiatives such as presence of women on the walls uh, initiative in uh, the Department of Medicine, as well as increasing awards given to female faculty and academics, which was a very powerful initiative that has led to an increase of a third for our internal faculty awardees. Um, so without further ado, I do want to acknowledge and please join me in a warm welcome to Dr. Oy and thanking her for all of her contributions to gender equity and ethics. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny, and um, to the audience. I've really appreciated learning with all of you this year. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Um, so here's the CME code, and um, I'm excited to get us started about where do we go from here? Improving gender equity is an ethical imperative. Um, so here are learning objectives. We're going to describe current gender equity successes at the University of Chicago, summarize the 28 um, gender equity talks that we had this year in the McLean Lecture Series, and discuss future goals for gender equity here. Um, so I get some funding from the ACP, but really my most relevant relevant experience for this talk is being the daughter of a very strong mother who um, had five different careers over my lifetime as a social worker, a florist, a teacher, um, and finished her career as a clinical psychologist at the end um, after I was already a physician, went back for training, um, but really a female mentor in my life that inspired me. Um, and I am also the um, daughter of a very strong male ally, my father father and he was the original um you know what's your plan what are you going to do how are you going to move up um not knowing anything about medicine but just really the confidant of asking me questions um and also a very strong female sister who is an associate medical dean at the university of alabama and so we um this has been part of my life for a long time and when i came to the university of chicago in 1997 for medical school um, my class was 50% female, and this was one of the draws, that there were so many female leaders. Norma Wagner was the dean at the time, um, you know, followed by Dr. Humphrey and now Dr. Aurora, and I just saw the University of Chicago as a place um, where females could be leaders. Um, we had multiple strong physician um, leaders throughout, um, starting with, you know, Dr. Rowley in oncology, Dr. Kubler-Ross in psychiatry, and so many others. 
Um, you know, if we look at currently our um, our gender equity statistics in the Department of Medicine, we have about 325 faculty, of which 43% are female, and it's very similar in the Biological Sciences Division. There are about a thousand faculty, and this has actually in increased from 40 to 43% over the last four or five years. So we have make made some strides. There really has not been a unifying rallying force for gender equity within our physician scientists, and I would argue that we still have work to do in this area. Um, so as I watched throughout my career, I had so many strong female mentors, which I'll, I'll thank at the end. Um, but one of them, uh, many of them were in this Department of Medicine uh, Women's Committee. It was formed in 1999, really to address gender specific issues in the Department of Medicine and to enhance the academic environment for women in, um, and trainees through networking, mentorship, to professional development and advocacy. Um, and so we have a very strong structure where we have subcommittees. Dr. Vollerman leads our, leads our advocacy subcommittee. Dr. Ruiz in dermatology just took over our professional development committee. Dr. Hoisen Sheets took over for Dr. Press in a newly formed committee that we started when I became the chair to really nominate women for every award in the institution. And then Adriana Olson in emergency medicine um, in, is in charge of our newsletter, which we send out and I'll tell you more details about. So a really strong commitment um, within the Department of Medicine. We have 25 faculty members on the committee, um, one from every section. We spend five-year terms, and we also have trainee representation. And it was really within that committee that I um, worked with Dr. Aurora and others and my, sub and my subcommittee leads, uh, mentored by Dr. Burnett, to really use these three R's to elevate gender equity. And so I'm going to use these three R's as a framework throughout our talk today. Um, and that is recognition, representation, and resources. Um, but as I took on senior uh, roles, what I noticed is more and more board meetings and things that I was, sit was sitting in were primarily men. And so we use, tried to use these three R's to make some changes. And so the first question we ask is, how is gender equity recognized at your hospital and institution? This is the awards work that Dr. Aurora mentioned that we published on. Simply by nominating women for each internal award, we had increased the awards from 36 to 59 percent um, and we are now like stretching out to look at national and regional awards um, so sometimes it's just a matter of nominating uh, is how you can get women nominated uh, to get the awards that lead to promotions and things we also really highlight accomplishments and speaking opportunities and i'll show you that data here so um, our whole committee pitched in to really evaluate the number of speakers at ground rounds and how gender equity was represented. So you can see here from 2004 to 2020, we separated out into internal speakers in the blue and external speakers in the red. So there is variability from year to year, but you can see both are increasing. However, the internal speakers got to a wrap um, at the end of 2020, which is when we stopped counting right before the pandemic. The internal speakers really got to the 43%, which is our representation of um, uh, female faculty within the department. Our external speakers was still lower. You can see like around 33%. I presented this back to the section chiefs and anecdotally, we've seen an increase in female speakers in our grand rounds. And we are planning to go back and um, evaluate this data. But just by talking about it and showing the data is really how you bring awareness to this. We also um, do recognition through a um, newsletter and our website. So in 2012, the, the Women's Committee um, launched the first newsletter just to really highlight the accomplishments of women faculty and trainees, um, disseminate information um, relevant to women physician scientists. Um, we, we send it out twice a year, so hopefully all of you in the audience get it. And if you, if you want to see them, they're all located on our website, which I, um, that I noted below. We also provide a peek into the work balance, uh, the work life balance of women faculty so people can see all the things that women faculty are juggling. Um, and we also um, take a look at all the grass, grass roots, grassroots level um, things that the medical students and our trainees are doing to support themselves and others. So the next question is representation. How is gender equity represented at your hospital and institution? And the first thing I'll 
focus on is structural changes. And then I'll show you a few slides about leadership changes. So when I um, first started as the chair of the Department of Medicine Women's Committee, we had a hallway in the Department of Medicine that looked like this picture on the left, which is like all of the chairmen of the Department of Medicine over the years, which were all white men. And when you walked into the, if you walked in to meet with the chairman, that was what you would see. And so we um, advocated and our chairman, Dr. Vokes was especially supportive in, um, in you know, giving some money to put some more women on the walls, including this prominent women section that balances out. We also put the chief residents up there and, um, and you'll see we also have this executive committee and our section chief council. So now if you walk into our department, um, the women on the wall, there are more women on the walls, there's more diversity on the walls. And it, um, if you're a trainee or a student, it feel, or even a young faculty, it's a place that you could see yourself uh, maturing and um, becoming you know, one of the senior faculty. And we also started tracking um, the leadership opportunities in our section. So this one is, it goes from right to left. So right is 2016. And we have had some significant, uh, some increases in um, our female section chiefs in red. Um, that's just under 40% right now. We, our female faculty has pretty much been stable at 43% over that time that we've been tracking. And um, our executive committee, um, you can see Dr. Vokes really uh, grew the committee and it increased representation for females between 2016 and 17. And then it's been steady around 50% since that time. So just by looking at the data, acknowledging, I think that's one of the things that I've seen that that really um, affects and brings to light um, how we can evaluate uh, representation and gender equity. Um, we also took a look at resources. I would not take credit for this myself, we, uh, but we did have a, um, a salary equity study that was not widely published, I think because of some the controversy around it, but we were shown it. And I will talk about salary equity um, uh, evaluation at the end also. Um, the, the, the Department of Medicine Women's Committee really started with like childcare resources and lactation resources. And that has become pretty standard, I'd say. Um, for those of you new to the institution, having Bright Horizons was part of that early advocacy um, and some of the lactation resources we have. And then Anna Vollerman has compiled elder care resources. We've done infertility counseling. And Dr. Vollerman and Dr. Aurora and Dr. Olapati applied for this NIH grant. Uh, oh, we got the NIH prize for enhancing faculty gender diversity. And I'll talk about that grant in just a second. We've also advocated for parental leave. Um, Dr. Ortiz Worthington is here in the in the audience, worked with Dr. Vollerman and one of our former trainees, Dr. Feld, to really just write these perspective pieces on um, supporting trainees um, in their parental leave and also breastfeeding. Um, and so advocating for those things at the institution and nationally has really been a part of the work of the Women's Committee. Um, and that led me to um, work with Dr. Siegler and then Dr. Angelos um, to start this gender equity series. And I'm really excited about the 28 speakers that we've invited over the last um, over the last year. I'm going to take a one minute per um, per and for those of you who were not able to be there. I tried to pick out some of the main highlights. So for the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to just summarize for you what we learned over the course of this gender equity lecture series. So Dr. Aurora started. She really did a tour de force overview of gender equity. And one of the new things that I learned from her was this term gender justice. Um, and you can see that gender justice is not not just women's rights. It really centers on gender-based discrimination um, in a, to work towards a world that affirms um, the lives of all people, racial justice, trans and queer rights, women's rights, immigrants' rights, just education justice, reproductive justice, anti-violence. So it's just it's bigger than just you know a women's committee. It's it's a whole um, and I think we tried to put speakers together that kind of represented gender justice. That was followed by Dr. Gottlieb. She came from the University of Massachusetts and she um, with Dr. Jags she had published some significant work on closing the gender pay gap in medicine. And the real takeaway that I got from her talk was start somewhere, do something. Don't let it paralyze you. Um, you know, she recommended conducting regular salary audits to determine these salary inequities, identifying where the, the gender pay gap is most concerning. Sometimes that's with incoming salaries. Sometimes that's the promotion. When people don't get promoted, they stay at the same salary. 
Um, and she talked about this framework of this compensation methodology that are the, that includes the drivers of disparities, including you know differences in base salaries, um, difference in productivity bonuses, and how part-time work and domestic duties and women spending more time with patients might affect that productivity. And in, in addition to the leaves we've talked about. And then she also talked about the leadership premiums and women um, not getting leadership and how that sometimes affects uh, salary equity in addition to rank and seniority. And so really started us off with this like push towards um, the closing the gender pay gap. Then we had Dr. Rejma Jagsi. She was at Michigan. She's now at Emory in radiation oncology. And this graph on the left really um, highlights the, uh, both the department, the increase in department chairs and um, the deans. And you can see there has been improvement from the 1980s till now. Um, the, but it really, if you look towards gender parity at 50%, we don't really reach that till 2070. So you can see lots of room to grow, to, to go. And she really talked about not fixing the women, but fixing the systems. And she focused on mentorship and sponsorship and um, kind of summarized many of the things that she's done research with on and a lot of the data that she's found in her work. Um, that was followed by Dr. Jesse Gold, who is a psychiatrist at Washington University. Dr. Gold um, kind of slowed us down a little bit and talked about um, women in medicine are burned out. Now, what do we do? Um, how can we address burnout? And um, the first thing she talked about is just policy level things that affect burnout and um, the vulnerability of sharing mental health issues. Um, this, this graph on the left is a map of the United States and um, it looks at the state board application rules um, it, with recommendations on physician wellness and burnout. So a state that meets all four would be a state that you're able to acknowledge your mental health, that you don't feel like you, when you reapply for your license, that you don't have to hide anything. And so a state that has four would be the best kind of states. A state that has one, zero would be states where people feel uncomfortable acknowledging burnout and mental health. And so you can see Illinois is a two, so some room to grow, to, to grow in Illinois. Um, and then she slowed us down even more and asked us to like start with self check-ins, check in on others, um, acknowledging vulnerability as a strength that mental health is not um, you know, a downfall, but it's something that makes us better clinicians and how we can become more vulnerable. And then she talked about five tips for individual coping um, with the kind of psychiatrist view of allowing space for feelings, practice self-compassion, um, and really that leaders need help too, that leaders don't have to be perfect. And I think that is a good acknowledgement for all of us. So Dr. Gold was followed by Dr. Moyer. Dr. Moyer um, is, is the one of the, the CEO of the American College of Physicians. And she her title was, and then there was four. And I was like, what does that title mean? And I'll tell you at the end. So she talked about gender equity and national leadership um, and really focusing on her work with the ACP. She showed us this picture of um, a 1982 ACP governor's meeting, which there were very few women in um, that meeting. And she said, since that time, ACP has been very involved with policy and advocacy about gender equity, forging collaborations, which we'll talk about in a second, affinity groups um, within the ACP um, state um, organizations. And then they really revised their national award and mastership descriptions to be more inclusive. And they also started tracking um, and reviewing data for, and publications. So in, in 1987, only 1% of the ACB Board of Governors were, were female, and that increased to 23% in 2007. And she was just in the midst of getting more updated data. They also look at their, they award masters of ACP. And in 2007, only 9% were, uh, women were masters, which improved to 32% in 2021, but some room to grow in that area also. And then in 2021, they looked at their awards that they gave at their national conference and they only had 22% of the national ACP awards were given to women. So just starting to acknowledge that there was some room for growth. Um, they joined this Council for Medical uh, Specialty Societies. There are 48 societies that are part of those. Many of our societies are part of this Council for Medical Specialties. Um, and the, then there were four meant that there were four um, women CEOs of these, uh, of these national societies in ACOG, ACS, ACP, and CMMS. So still some room to grow. And I think she was acknowledging that and her role in that. 
We were then I'm joined by Argavon Sales, who's from Stanford. And uh, Dr. Sales was very vulnerable about us experiencing sexual harassment and kind of naming this pyramid for sexual harassment that starts really at the bottom with a power differential that many people feel in medicine and then progresses on to harassment because of gender, sexual attention and coercion. And she um, went through um, kind of a survivor's timeline from when the harassment started here to confusion about what to do with it, to mental um, emotional distress, to when it was reported, and then kind of the like, you know, not a clean line, but kind of the mishmash of things that happened, including legal fees and career loss and changes, therapy, relationship strain, and then a settlement, and then still not knowing where to go from there. So I think it was a kind of vulnerable and um, honest uh, discussion about sexual harassment in the medical setting and what happens when uh, the loss that happens when it happens in medicine. That was followed by Dr. Marshall from University of Pennsylvania, who talked about motherhood in medicine. And, um, you know, many of us have seen this graph with on the right, which um, talks about the fertility rate, which is higher in young women 20 in their 20s and decreases significantly to women in their 40s. Um, and then also the increase of spontaneous abortions or miscarriages. Um, and that is overlapped with basically the exact time for medical training and expected early career productivity. So she proposed this just the facts solution, which includes flexibility for, um, for young mothers, autonomy to be in charge of the schedule, um, having childcare options, um, allowing for time off, and then also sponsorship and mentorship. And one of the other things that I love, which is not fit in to this facts, is that she really, I think she built this schedule for all the things that um, a, par a parent responsible for children does at work, including the expected pre-work and post-work meetings, plus notes, and then the same kind of life schedule that's happening at the same time, just acknowledging kind of the, the burden that um, not just mothers, but parents carry who are physicians and, and working. Um, that was followed by Dr. Cortina, who's at University of Michigan, um, and she really um, was part of this um, consensus report that was done by the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine on the sexual harassment of women. And they, she focused on this iceberg model, which we saw many times during the course of the lecture series, that really very few of these come-ons happen, and that's, but that is where most of the policies and procedures are oriented. And many more um, of the things that actually happen in medicine are these put-downs, um, including derisive remarks or gendered contempt. And the question was, what are we really doing um, at the bottom of the iceberg? Um, she also talked about how common it was. And um, I think I was shocked by the difference of medicine versus the other STEM sciences. So you can see in this large university system in the Southwest, this is the a percentage that, for instance, gender harassment happens. And in medicine, 45% compared to engineering and science or non-STEM. I think that was just shocking to me. I had not seen it presented that way. And, um, and so you can see the other things about gender harassment, unwanted sexual attention, and sexual coercion are a little bit more similar, but still higher in medicine. And, and I, I guess I didn't know that when I went into medicine and I, I didn't sense it until I saw that data. And then she summarized with how we can better prevent and respond to sexual harassment. And she really talked about this culture of respect. It's not, um, it's that we work at an institutional level to develop this institution culture of respect within hiring, evaluation, and promotion, within our everyday practices, and also within our built environment, which I will talk about later. That led us to Dr. Silver. Dr. Silver is a PM&R physician from Harvard. Um, and uh, Dr. Silver has published a number of papers that will, were cited multiple times over the course of the lecture series. What I was most interested in is how she got into the work. And what she did was she looked at Harvard's promotion criteria for a professor to medicine. And then she did research on publication of senior authors in books and in papers. She published this. And then she looked at um, authors of guidelines and how many times they were female. She looked at, uh, again, at the senior author publications. She also looked at visiting per, per, professor, professorships and invitations to speak nationally. So this like who's speaking at the institutions and published on that. She published on leadership roles, started within her own PM&R institution and then published some of the national data. 
Um, you know, she also talked about um, editors and journals and is published on multiple edit ed journals and what percent um, females are editors. Um, and then really talked about peer reviewed funding and other national um, leadership um, missions. And then she summed up with this is that, um, you know, women um, institutions hire and make a huge financial commitment to, to women physicians. And then, um, and then there's becomes this like the gender barriers that happen and some women leave academic medicine and those who stay, sometimes they move up more slowly. Um, and if, um, if they if, if they move up at all. And so it really inspired us to kind of look at our promotion guidelines and what are we doing to, to change those and think about those. Dr. Melissa Gilliam, who was a former ob gyne here, is now the provost at the Ohio State University. And she introduced the kind of concept of this academic ecosystem, um, talking about um, her role at Ohio State. And um, she, uh, as a dean, how she is a diversity champion, changing practices for hiring, looking at leadership, holding leaders accountable and yourself accountable, interrupting power structures, and also brought up this concept of wellness. So there was a number of themes that were kind of continually repeated over the course of the, of the lecture series. And then we had um, Dr. Conroy, who is the CEO um, uh, at Dartmouth Health. And she really talked about um, not only um, academic medicine, but also hospital-based medicine and healthcare and in general. As the CEO, she's in charge of everything. And she talked about this concept that um, women really make 80% of the decisions in healthcare, and this includes RMAs and our RNs. And so how involved women are in medicine, but then when you look at the board of governance, um, CEOs and CEOs at top hospitals, it really drops off significantly. And she talked about her role as a CEO at Dartmouth Health. Um, and she you know, gave us more data about the percentage of CEOs that are women in healthcare, the percentage of CMOs that are women, um, looking at deans and department chairs and division chiefs. I think for me, it's just an emphasis on, we need to keep looking at our data. Like what, what's our data at our institution? What's our data nationally? Um, and she reiterated some things about authorship that we had heard before. And then she kind of su summarized with these tenets for gender equity, examining a recruitment process and the leadership team. Again, she brought up respect. So that word of respect came up multiple times, um, creating visibility and recognition at a seat at the table. Um, she talked about, you know, looking at the data and disaggregating the data, and then also brought up this transparent approach to pay, even if it's, a, if it's uncomfortable to like show salaries, you still have to do it. Um, and then talking about it's not just something that women do, and I think this happens at multiple levels, um, that it's everyone's job, not just women, to talk about gender inequality. Um, and then Dr. Peak really inspired us, as she always does, um, talking about the intersectionality of the systems of oppression. And I think for me, the eye-opening thing was, I think I um, maybe perhaps the white man is sometimes, uh, you know, criticized. But I, what she showed is that also white women have a role in um, in that intersectionality of oppression. And she talked about Emmett Till and um, his accuser, who recently passed away, and how much power, you know, she, this white woman had over this African American young boy, and how that might, you know, flow into our into the clinic where me as a white woman and and my interactions with, um, with, um, you know, black men, and I, I was really, I was really impacted by that and really changed my practice about not only white men, but also white women have have maybe abused power. Um, she also talked about racism within anti-sexism. So within the uh, women's rights movements, um, sometimes there was groups of African-American um, suffragettes that were not um, always recognized um, or included in the movement. She also talks about sexism within anti-racism. So within the civil rights movement, there were some unheard black women that weren't acknowledged as part of the process. And then she she ended with these um, invisible visits of black middle class women in the American healthcare system and really brought to light some of the times that middle class African American women have not been heard. And I think for me, it was really impactful to kind of recognize all these intersectionalities and bring them into my clinical practice and think about how we're addressing these um, topics here. 
That was followed by a panel on allyship and gender equity, Dr. Shika Jane at UIC, and also the CEO of Women in Medicine Summit, um, runs an inclusive leadership lab for men to participate in how to be better allies. And she brought two of her allies, Jeremy Yardley in pediatrics and David Smith, who's a PhD at Hopkins. Um, and they really talked about developing allyship uh, principles, showing persistent interpersonal support and genuine partnership for women, um, thoughtful and intentional development of uh, trusted confidants as a man to make, ask how you are being seen and supporting, um, and then counteracting challenges to perceiving and taking action against bias, bias harassing, sexist, sexist language and behavior, and basically brought us this concept of, wow, if you hear something like, wow, can I just acknowledge what was said right there? If I'm the attending physician in, the, in a clinical setting or hear something in the clinic, not just letting it pass, but acknowledging it right there. Um, and then um, talking about uh, clarity and transparency and accountability um, in a gender inclusive workplace. Um, and then that was followed by Dr. Stella Safo, who's at Mount Sinai. Um, Dr. Safo talked about navigating um, adversity in healthcare and was shared about experience of um, harassment at Mount Sinai. And she was very vulnerable talking about um, there was a group of people that were that felt that were harassed. Um, and at first they weren't acknowledging what was happening. They trusted the institution would, would do something about a harasser, um, was not, they didn't document it in real time and they expected the institution would do the right thing and, and weren't, they didn't plan ahead, but they did um, band together. They um, created this Justice Now um, uh, organization and they sought legal representation. They learned about their rights. They learned documentation, made a little noise and created an advocacy platform. And, um, and so I think it was an eye-opening uh, lecture to hear about an experience of a significant harassment event and how to work at the institution where it was still happening. And um, so she recommended and these tools to survive and thrive, including knowing your rights, documenting, HR is not your friend. That made me cringe a little bit. I just, you know, HR sometimes is your friend, but um, in that experience, they did not feel like it at Mount Sinai. Um, they um, learned various modalities for self-protection and advocacy and be prepared for blowback and how to deal with that. So it was a quite an eye-opening talk and I, um, it was just interesting to learn about how that, that might happen. Then Dr. Humphrey, who of course was our Dean for Medical Education, is now at the Maidsey Institute, came and talked about gender equity in medical education. We convened a group of medical educators to listen to her in a small group setting beforehand. And um, Dr. Humphrey talked about flourishing um, in medical education and really talked about these case studies um, in gender-based medical student mistreatment, gender bias in assessment, and pregnancy and maternity leave. And I, I, shared, I shared with you one of the examples here uh, Dr. Humphrey showed this four by four table of support um, and how to support a trainee, this being low support and this being high support and um, and in a challenge as a leader, low challenge versus high challenge. And she recommended that we really um, push ourselves into this growth mindset here. And that if there was this case study of a young uh, woman who experienced um, mistreatment on during a surge of rotation. And um, she recommended this kind of response. I will speak to the program director and to the attending. Your experience in the OR was unacceptable. Furthermore, we will make sure that you have time in the sim lab to practice skills if you feel you need to um, more educational opportunities. So really pushing ourselves not to retreat, not to stasis, not to just confirm like, oh, that's terrible, but to this area of growth. Um, and so we really grew from Dr. Humphrey's expertise in gender equity and medical, educa medical education. Then we had Dr. Ross, who of course was one of our ethics greats here at University of Chicago, has recently moved to a leadership position at Rochester. And she came back to share with us Publisher Parish, Women as Authors and Peer Reviewers in Pediatrics. Um, and so you can see she looked at um, many, three different journals, JAMA Pediatrics, Pediatrics, and Journal of Pediatrics. And then she summarized um, the work here. These are first other publications, which has been increasing um, up to 60%. And then she looked at um, Senior Author, which increased at a slightly slower rate. And she looked at the editorial board and she gave us these three takeaways that female representation on editorial boards continues to parallel female representation of senior authors. 
that the rise of women as first and last authors between 2016 and 21, uh, 2021 is the same, and that women were historically underrepresented in pediatrics as first authors, but have increased faster than their growth as junior female faculty, a female junior faculty. So she talked about pediatrics as an area where there's more than 70% of the pediatricians are, are females, and they um, have like kind of grown more during um, than their than their growth in pediatrics. That was followed by a very own Dr. Paul, who's in gastroenterology here, who talked about overcoming the challenges, mitigating disparities in the LGBTQ community. She gave us this amazing history of LGBTQ um, health starting in 1952 when homosexuality was still labeled a mental um, disorder and then kind of ending in March of 2021 when our uh, first transgender leader was named to the be the assistant health secretary. And she kind of summarized in her talk um, steps for inclusive training programs, including um, openly discussing inclusivity and recruiting diverse training groups, um, support for identity-based training at the GME level, and um, having, we I'll tell you a picture in a few slides about our outpatient group, having mentoring and also re research and education, improving our LGBTQ um, curriculum and education at all levels, um, and then make, putting pronouns on email, Zoom, and social media, having inclusive, inclusive benefit packets, which she acknowledged that University of Chicago has, has grown and has fairly good inclusive benefits packages now, and then supporting out trainees and doing that consciously. Um, that was followed by Dr. Yana Gallen, who is across the street in public policy, and um, she used these net networking is did research in public policy, and she um, took a hundred students, and some of them were law, some business, um, none medical, and um, and ten thousand professionals, and um, she used she said a networking platform, which I asked her later was LinkedIn, and um, she had the students really modify their profile, take personal stuff out of there, just really their education. She had the students rank their professionals and select which professionals they wanted to email. And then they each um, sent a hundred messages. Um, and then um, over three weeks, they just they saw how many responses they got back. They rated, the, they calculated response rates. They looked at career attributes, and they looked at the length and sentiment and word usage of responses. And then they also looked at career plans. So on the left here is um, what the students wanted to get from this experience. You can see not too many differences. Um, you know, they wanted to hear about daily tasks and the jobs maybe a little bit more. Women wanted to hear about the career trajectory and growth. Similarities until we get to here, which, oh, which is interesting that women, this 10, uh, where I put the arrow is um, work-life balance. And, um, you know, men wanted to hear about work-life balance even more than women. And um, that is not what happened. Uh, in their findings, when the professionals responded to these students, more of those professionals talked about work-life balance in the response emails. Um, they had two times more mentions of work-life balance when they had the, the student sent a broad email question. They had a, um, and then the students were also instructed to send a specific, like what is the work-life balance in your career? And those questions got 28% more responses than the other kind of broad and culture questions. Um, they really got no gender differences in the workplace culture question, no difference in responses. Um, and they, she kind of summarized that there was suggestive evidence of gender gaps in the information, um, and that might lead to gender gaps in career decisions. So really interesting kind of policy level research. That was followed by Dr. Vollerman, who gave us a talk on gender equity and caregiving. And, um, and in her final recommendations, she talked about institutional level things that could be done, including um, 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 policy work and um, flex flexible start and end times and telehealth options, adjusting calls and RVUs for leave and lactation, which I know our surgery colleagues are working on, and the revisiting the traditional promotion and tenure timelines. As a community, she talked about child care and elder care and services, um, and then at a policy level, um, talking about this paid parental leave and paid sick leave. And then finally, she introduced the work that she, Dr. Aurora and Dr. Olapati are doing um, as they were able to get a grant to fund um, COVID, the COVID-19 fund to retain clinical uh, scientists, which are these 10 members here, which they are funding out of the COVID pandemic, trying to support those with young families um, and make sure that their research doesn't tailor off because of the stress that they had in, during the COVID pandemic. 
That was then followed by um, Dr. Carl Street, who's a graduate of the University of Chicago and now in Boston. And he talked about beyond binaries. He really emphasized um, understanding kind of the sexual orientation, gender identity terminology, making sure that physicians are aware and that we as educators and physicians are aware of those things. He also talked about kind of the, the generational changes that are happening and, um, and how we as faculty and, and trainees need to be aware of kind of the increase in the Generation Z um, where it's um, the total LGBTQ plus community is definitely growing and healthcare needs to be prepared for that. He also met with um, our students and our residents in our outpatient groups and was able to support them and give them ideas for change. And his final recommendations were these, ensuring collection of SOGI data in the electronic health record and um, incorporating LGBT content into our curricula and requiring CME even for um, more senior faculty for LGBTQ health. Um, and he also focused on cardiovascular health disparities, which is his specific area of interest. That was followed by Dr. Pringle Miller, who has started this Physician for Just Equity um, um, and, uh, organization. She's a graduate of the University of Chicago, living in California, but working at UIC. And she really supports um, people who have gone through harassment or issues that have happened within their workplace. Um, and they, um, this Physicians for Just Equity, those people would reach out, they assign them a navigator, and they engage a team and they meet with the person who has experienced harassment and they really support them through the process because there really is no kind of external to your institution. If something happens, how do you, how do you walk through that? Um, so she talked about what um, Physicians for Just Equity does, um, how they do research and outreach and education. It was also really inspiring what she's done with her work. That was followed by State of Women in Surgery, a panel of our surgery colleagues um, who talked about microaggressions in surgery. And I, I think I was interested here when they compared medical students, residents, and attendings, um, how high this attending for feeling like second-class citizens was um, here, and also just how high all of these were for environmental validations um, and assumption of trajectory traditional gender roles. Um, so they presented interesting data that was surgery focused. They also talked about sources of discrimination is not always the same. So if you think about gender discrimination in, in surgery, at least it came primarily from patients or, or nursing staff. Um, in this, in this st study, if you talk about verbal or emotional abuse that mostly came from attendings, when you talk about physical abuse, lower numbers, but also attending, they talked about sexual harassment, it was um, a variety of patients and um, and uh, and attendings, but also men noted that they got sexual harass sexual harassment um, from nurses. Um, and then in pregnancy or childcare discrimination, sometimes that added co-residents, peers, like you're putting a burden on me when you're taking time off. Um, and so um, that was followed by our colleague, Dr. Dr. Kaur from OB, who talked about gender equity and family planning um, and noted um, in how after in 1960s, after contraception was introduced in the um, pregnancy rates declined in the 18 to 19 and 20 to 24 year olds, and then Planned Parenthood and how that affected. She also talked about the rise at that same time as contraception was in was coming onto play and uh, rates of pregnancies were decreasing, um, that you know, in, there was increasing matriculants to medical school and um, applicants to medical school and talked about kind of where we have gone with medical school applications. Um, and then she also talked about Roe versus Wade and, and how um, in our current society, um, there is you know, such varied access across the nation. Um, Illinois, of course, being in, in Teal, the expanded access, but surrounded by a number of states that have either hostile or not protected access. And kind of in summarized, to summarize her work, um, this access to contraception and abortion has contributed gender equity. Not all genders receive equitable family planning. Um, that the use of contraception of abortion is highly prevalent among U.S. physicians and fosters gender equity. And these threats that we're experiencing now to contraception and abortion are threats to bodily autonomy, justice, and undermining gender equity. Um, so we have a couple more left. This was the CEO of uh, Morehouse Medicine who was able to meet with some of our underrepresented medicine residents and faculty and um, really talked about um, there's no health without wealth. And so she talked about educational debt, which you can see here is um, the highest for um, African-American women and then 
African-American men, but also high in, in, other, um, in other races. And so she talked about longitudinal associations between wealth and health and wrecking the impact of this unrealized potential on gender inequality. Um, and then she talked about the role of education as the equalizer in achieving health equity. And this is her kind of career trajectory that she showed. Um, she moved up in socioeconomic status from her time in rural Georgia to her time as president and CEO. Um, and then she named all of the um, educational mentors and sponsors who really lifted her up in that time. And so um, that was inspiring to me. That was also followed by Paula Martin, who is one of our, um, our colleagues across the in the, at the college, talked about intervention, ethics, and trans youth. She had gone to a clinic in California and observed over 100 kind of discussions between a physician and transgender youth and their parents. And she really kind of brought home the terminology and also the stories of these um, families, the providers and the children um, about how to you know, support gender diverse children. And she talked about this, this concept of persistence versus desistance. Um, also talked about possible timelines of intervention where families maybe start with social changes like changing hair and changing, changing what you wear and then moving on to more medical um, um, kind of decisions. Um, and so she summarized this, that define, denying gender affirming care creates massive inequalities in healthcare for trans youth. Um, and at, really challenged me actually, are the expectations for trans youth mat, matched by expectations for their cisgender counterparts? So when questions were asked of her, she said, like, would you ask that of a cisgender, a cisgender young person? And, and oftentimes we kind of treat the questions differently. Um, and so, um, that was summed up by last week. We had um, Dr. Weiler here from Florida who talked, used the AAMC data um, to look at gender disparities in rank and tenure at American medical centers. And um, they um, compared, they used AAMC data to look at the basic science kind of increase in um, promotions to assistant professor and the clinical science promotions to assistant professor. You can see that the expectation is that right around now we are achieving gender parity in assistant professors. There's a little bit of room to go in basic science assistant professors. But when you and she walked through associate and full, and when she walked and when she talked about basic science full professors and clinical science full professors, we have between 20 and 30 years to go before we reach gender parity. Um, she also talked about this um, academic medicine timeline. Um, and really went over 40 years and how the changes in medicine have affected kind of promotion. Um, so really inspired some changes here. So I'm just gonna use the last 15 minutes to, um, to sum up what we can do at the University of Chicago. And then I'd love to hear discussion. And I'm gonna focus back on this recognition, representation and resources. So um, in recognition, um, I think we have not really looked at tracking BSD um, and departmental level of awards. Um, and we have not looked at all at tracking national um, and regional awards, at least from our institution outwards. So would love to see some tracking of awards more globally. Um, salary equity, I know that the, the FAC is um, looking and talking with salary equity um, and making some proposals to the Dean and, um, and talking about how that could be more transparent. Um, and I think that is really important for those of us who've been asking for that for many years. Um, promotion equity, I think we might be a little bit more behind on, but working with OAA to think about what uh, at what rates are, um, are people promoted and how much time are they spending in their rank um, and tracking that data. I think what I've learned in my role is that data really speaks. And so if we're able to look at that data um, and evaluate it, that could lead to some growth for us um, at the university. And also speaking opportunities, thinking about, you know, we looked at department medicine grand rounds. I'm not sure what happens in surgery grand rounds or site grand rounds. What happens um, at the hospital level? Like who's speaking and who are people hearing speak and is it equal and equitable? And are we measuring that? Um, I took a look at our um, hospital leadership yesterday, and so it's um, uh, at, at a BSD level, it's broken down into basic science chairs, which you can see is the highest at 30% female um, with three of the 10 basic science chairs um, being female and our clinical chair is two of 14 and that's new because of course Tessa Balich was just named as the orthopedics chair. Um, but we typically, I think this is what I've seen is that there's been a little bit slower uptake in leadership and we need to be at least looking and tracking that data. There's also the academic deans um, of which three or of 17 are female. And, and that's not even asking the question, do we have 
you know, um, what are of the, we didn't even talk about racial diversity and other and other diversity within these people. So I think looking at it, evaluating ourselves and asking for asking for data is really important. Um, when we talk about structural changes we had, there was some structural changes. If you walk in the Ellis entrance, there is now um, kind of some more representation on the walls that is diverse and and um, and recognizes kind of like the work that um, many people do with, uh, within the biological sciences division. Um, we of course have always had our pictures of medical schools in the hallway. So as you walk to P117, you can see that and that brings some diversity. Um, but we of course are sitting in P117. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to look at the walls. Dr. Burnett and I have been um, evaluating these are four um, you know, people, historic figures at the University of Chicago who have had scientific um, expertise or clinical expertise and should be honored. But I think we um, also think that there's, it should be a place that we sit for many, many lectures and celebrations that should represent the people sitting in the room. And so we, um, we raised a little bit of money and um, put a proposal together to how we could change this. Um, these were the people that we proposed and um, this proposal has been sitting for a little bit with COVID, um, but we hope to continue to advocate for funding and also just to acknowledge like these were significant historic figures at the University of Chicago and to acknowledge they're from all different departments, they're from all different areas of research and just to see people and there are also some, di some diversity to see people that, you know, that um, had amazing scientific discoveries, but also re is more reflective of who's sitting in the room. Um, so we, uh, I think for resources, there has been some structure, but not a lot of structure for gender equity at the University of Chicago. Um, surgery has a new women's committee for the last year. They've had this uh, led by Dr. Ferris. Pediatrics has had a women's committee that's had um, two or three different leaders currently led by Dr. Darlington and Dr. Williams. But we've been proposing a gender equity committee that there will be, would be a committee that would kind of bring these groups together, not only medicine and surgery and pediatrics, but also radiology has a um, diversity inclusion council and also representation from other specialties, um, also including basic science and perhaps in later states the hospital and that this committee would really um, have 12 to 15 members they would have a professional development subcommittee um, and mostly as I've been talking data really speaks so having a data subcommittee so we do submit data to the AAMC on our hospital um, and, and we have access to the AAMC. I think many of our speakers uh, mentioned that. So I have that data. The Office of Faculty Affairs has that data. But who is really looking at that data and asking how we can improve it? What are we doing with the data? I think we submit without, um, without using it. Um, and so really tracking this, what is the gender equity in the BSD in, our, in each department at the leadership level? Um, what's our data for promotion and salary equity? I think these are all areas where data really speaks and can push this effort forward. And I think a committee could really like keep this focus and keep encouraging these, um, moving these things forward. Um, so again, a dashboard of data. And then the advocacy subcommittee, um, you know, one of the things that I have learned is that it really is not just about parental leave for women and that, you know, as, as long as we equalize in men and women and anyone who takes wants to take parental leave is able to take it, then it becomes everyone's job to like balance a family and raise that family up. And so the surgery department has really been focusing on scripts for staff. What do you say when people leave, when they're coming back, who's going to cover, um, do we have support for coverage? And then um, we don't have lactation policies. Some there's individual, like when you have clinic, like how much time you can take off for lactation. We don't have that for trainees at all, and we don't have a universal policy, so working on that. And then that also this ramp up and ramp down time, I think surgeons specifically, um, but for many of us, work compression, like you do the same amount of work in the nine months of the year that you would do in the three months, in the 12 months of the year when, you, when you're on leave, and like acknowledging, and acknowledging that and having policies for that. One of the things we also leave on the table is um, is national conferences. I was uh, lucky to be part uh, to be nominated to go to this AAMC Early Career Faculty Development. It really helped me to see what promotion was like at other places. Um, but I'm not sure that we're nominating someone on a regular basis. And I think this committee would, you know, make sure that we are annually sending someone here. There's also a mid-career faculty development um, opportunity that we could take advantage of. And then there is ELAM, the Executive Leadership in Academic Medicine. Dr. Burnett took part of that, um, and a few other 
of faculty at the University of Chicago, but we have not on a regular basis sent um, a leader there to have extra training. We have not um, nominated someone on a regular basis. So having some kind of um, or, you know, some kind of plan to how we would nominate support at someone every year. You, you have to you have to get awarded it. So someone might, might not get awarded it every year, but at least we have a plan to do that on a regular basis. This is also bring us alignment with our peer institutions. There are deans for gender equity at many of our peer institutions. Other places like Colorado have gender equity task force. Um, so I think we need some kind of structure here at the University of Chicago to kind of coalesce these efforts together. Um, oh, and I should have mentioned that um, this, this Women in Medicine Summit um, and the, there's a leadership accelerator that we could be sending people to. One of our faculty, Dr. Press, has been part of that, but we are just not taking advantage of things that are out there, perhaps for financial, but perhaps just because we don't have a structure to do it. Um, you know, some of the areas we talked about, like wellness, um, we have had new um, um, new plan. Of course, we have Dr. Bree Andrews, our new chief wellness officer. And um, I think there are plans around that to focus on that kind of slowing down that Dr. Gold brought us to. Um, sexual harassment, I don't know. I, maybe other people in the audience know, but we at the university or the college is part of the National Academies Collaborative, but we in the hospital and the BSD, I'm not sure are accessing yet. There's no kind of, how do we, you know, talk about harassment? Do we have data about microaggressions? How often it's happening? How would we report it? Who would we report it to? As the chair of the Women's Committee, I, people often come to me. And, um, you know, and so there's all these questions about how bad does it have to be to go to Title IX? And then you're often working with um, a leader who may or may not understand or support. So I think we could have better kind of policies and um, um, reporting for sexual harassment. Um, for allyship, um, I don't think we have any training now on allyship. There is this inclusive leadership lab, which recommendations we could be sending male allies there to really talk about this. Um, LGBTQ plus and transgender health, um, we're having increasing um, education. In a separate role I'm doing with some students I'm working on, um, they are really um, engaging with our DE&I um, office um, about SOGI training and how um, this is gonna roll out with like a C required CME, I think maybe later this summer for all um, faculty and also just making it more uh, acceptable for our patients. Maybe you were familiar that our patients were asked to put their pronouns in um, and, and gender, uh, preferred gender into the my chart. And um, we did get 32,000 responses, but that's only 1% of our patient populations. So we as an institution need to do better um, to make it an accept, um, um, uh, uh, inclusive environment for our patients and our staff and trainees. Um, and then intersectionality. I think, you know, I have been got the benefit of implicit bias training through some of the recruitment things that we've been doing, but I don't know that we do that on a regular basis um, here. And then increased support for DI and data tracking in that intersection intersectionality area. So um, with that, oh, with one minute left, I would just like to conclude that we have made great strides in gender equity over the last few decades. But I think if we were going to focus on um, some increased um, areas for improvement, we should really develop a centralized structure and support for gender equity like that um, BSD Gender Equity Committee that we should really work towards with back and the OAA transparent salary and promotion equity because I think I get asked about that a lot. Um, and finally, I think there are some really tangible structural changes that we could make, um, including this room, um, um, to support gender equity. So I'd just like to, um, to summarize with thanks to, this is the members of the Department of Medicine Women's Committee, um, the staff Morgan Ely and Nancy Zavala and Annette Westerberg. Dr. Aurora had to run to her um, senior scientific, but um, Dr. Aurora and Dr. Vinci have been mentors to me personally. And, um, and then finally, some of our leaders, Dr. Vokes and Dr. Anderson. And I'd just like to um, end with a huge thanks to our ethics staff, I don't know if you know, Vita Makrachi has been a new ethics staff and is, um, you know, having a hybrid lecture series has not been without its flaws, but um, has done a really great job of 
managing Zoom participants and putting these up on the McLean website. Um, and um, Dr. Angelos, of course, for his new leadership. And then the rest of the staff, Renana, I don't know if you know, has been on Zoom in the background recording all these. And so the ethics staff has really done a tremendous job in running um, this ethics lecture series. Um, and then finally to my family who, um, you know, as I have moved through the University of Chicago has been a tremendous support of source of strength for me. Um, so I will summarize there and um, we can take time for questions um, or, or thoughts um, or ideas about how you think we should move forward at the University of Chicago. <laughs> Vita. Any thoughts or ideas? Yes. Can you say that one more time? The gender parity, you talk about gender? Yeah, oh, interesting. So um, I, I know a little bit about this from, you know, being an internal medicine associate program director, um, but I don't know about like every, I, I, I don't know if I could speak to every program. Um, I know the medical school focuses on it and I wish Dr. Aurora would be here to talk about that. Um, but I know that for instance, in internal medicine, I'll use an example is that we had been at 50% and then 50% women and men in internal medicine residency. And then we slipped to 60, 40. And we asked ourselves why, like, why was that happening? And we really had to intentionally interview more women and rank more women on our internal medicine rank list. I'm two of the leaders of the, of the selection committee are sitting right here and they could give you the details. We had to do that so that we would reach gender parity. And so that's a local example. Um, I'm not sure if that's happening at a at a, at a university example, but I think that we do need to be aware of it. Um, and I think my interactions with the surgical, my surgical colleagues is that they also have to be very aware of it. Um, but I think it's a great thing. It's like, are we tracking it? Are we watching it? Do we have to be very intentional earlier on is your point, right? Yeah, thank you for that. Anything else? Great. Well, thank you for participating in the lecture series. Um, the Ethics Fellows, if you want to come down and just say one last, you know, um, discussion, I'd love to chat with you one more time. But thank you again. And um, it was great to, um, this is the concludes the Ethics Lecture Series. So thanks.